Now, I know from watching your podcast, you were in the rampers and, uh, you know, you guys were basically uh, committing some petty crimes. Uh, there was no money and stuff. But when was it in your life that you knew that you were going to be a member of organized crime or at least associated with organized crime? Was there a specific point in your life? Like, did you aspire that from when you were younger or just as time went on and you got involved in things? It just happened. How'd that go, Sam? I never wanted it. We in the ramp is it, we, you know we had this stupid motto: "Fuck the mob, it's us against the world." So we didn't want to have nothing to do with the mob. Um, later on, I when I was 19 years old, I got drafted. I went into the army during the Vietnam War, and uh, I spent two years in. And uh, when I came out, most of the rampers had hooked up with mafia guys and. It changed around while I was gone. I still didn't hook up with anybody. And then after a while, I hooked up with Shorty Spiro and the Colombo family. And uh, he told me what I wanted to hear. He said, Sammy, I'll never backstab. I'll never lie to you. Anytime I ask you to do something, I've already done it or I'll do it with you. You're going to be part of a family. That became music to my ears. If I had to be with anybody who was an ex-fighter, I shook his hand and I said, okay, I'll be in. And that's where I started basically in the Colombo family. And it wasn't until I was, I got out of the military when I was 21. I think I hooked up when I was about 22 or 23. I think 23. But uh, I hooked up with the Colombo family. That's where I did my first murder. I never killed anybody before that. What was your relationship with John Gotti, like before the shit hit the fan, what was it like on a day to day basis doing business? He's the boss. You're the underboss. What was it like to work for him? Listen, I love the guy. We were attached at the hip. I did everything under the sun for him. When I cooperated, there was every, almost every one of his trials. I was in the background, rigging the trial, paying people, threatening people. I, I did everything under the sun, kill for him. He was in trouble with Castellano, him and Angelo Ruggiero and their tapes. Um, when they came to us, me, Frankie DeChico, for help, we talked about it for quite a while. I talk about it on my podcast, and uh, we decided to save them by taking Paul out. That wasn't the only reason. Paul did a lot of fucked up things towards the end. I liked him immensely as well in the beginning. But he did a lot, a lot of bad things towards the end. Got very greedy and um, doing all kinds of weird shit. So between doing bad things and screwed up things for the family, this thing happened with John and Angelo. They were finished. So we decided to save them, get rid of Paul, and try to change Rosenostra back to what it was. It didn't work out. Frankie De Chico was blown up and killed four months later. And uh, John just completely, I don't know, he lost control of himself a little at a time. He fell in love with himself, seeing himself on television. He was playing a role. Most people, what they want to hear told is they want to hear, you You kept the, the life and you, you valued the life and you always sort of kept that thing, Cosa Nostra, that's Cosa Nostra. You know, that's our thing. And you always kept that close to your heart. Yet people want to know what made you then cooperate. Wow, that's that's a hell of a story. It's on my podcast. You know, all my life, as you guys know, I've been busted all my life. I've been asked to cooperate a 100 times. I never did. When I went to prison with John Gotti in 1990, um, he really didn't want to go to prison. And uh, it was the worst 11 months I've did out of the 22 years I've been in prison. And he was really horrible to do time with. You know, Jerry Capisi, a little while ago, called me up and he said, I did an interview with F. Lee Bailey just the other day. Now, I didn't get along too much with F. Lee Bailey, and uh, I don't think he liked me too much either, but this is what the guy said in his interview. He said, when the lawyers were restricted, who could represent us, who can't, we called him in. He's a good lawyer. There's no question about it. And uh, 
he said to John, he said, John, you're admitting these things and talking about Sammy and Frankie on the tapes. You just can't beat this case. What I suggest is that you take a play. John looked at him and said, I got an ace in the hole. I'm going to throw Sammy and Frankie Lacasio under the bus. I'm going to throw the weight on them, and I'm going to beat the case. Effley Belly said, when John told him that, he left the room and never came back. He didn't want any part of doing that. He didn't want any part of the case, and he left. At first, I thought he was joking. So I didn't get too upset, even though we weren't getting along while we were in prison. After 11 months, he he told me, he said, Sammy, I got a way where I could beat the case. Not we, he could beat the case. He says, I'm going to control all the lawyers. And I'm going to back up the tapes. I'm talking about you on tape. The lawyers are going to say, you hear John Gotti complaining about Sam. He's killing everybody. He's taking over businesses. He's taking over the unions, which was all bullshit. So the people are going to listen. The juries are going to listen. They're going to listen to the tapes. They're going to listen to what the lawyers say. Poor John Gotti. You hear him on the tape. He lost control of this animal. So they're going to convict you, and I'm going to go free. I told him, is is that what you want? He said, the streets needs the boss, and I'm the boss. It has to be that way. You have to take the weight. Now, I completely understand agents and cops want to put bad guys away. That's your job. I understand that. I don't have any hard feelings towards you guys at all, agents or anybody else. That's your job. But our job is to survive the case. We're together. We're brothers. Whoever could beat the case, God bless him. That wasn't John's attitude. John's attitude was he would beat the case no matter what. So I had turned around when he said he, that's what he was going to do. And I asked him, is that what you really want to do? And he said, yes. I turned away, no argument. In my mind, I said, fuck the mafia, fuck him. I'm going to the other side. And I flipped. And that's exactly what I did. Later on, it showed that everything he said on those tapes, I never had a partner or killed a partner and took over a business. I never killed anybody to take over a union. Later on, it came out was that was a plot. He was trying to plot to kill me. And he needed a reason. You just can't kill your underboss who's extremely loyal to you, a big money maker for the family. If you do that, you scare everybody. Because people will turn around and say, if he could kill him, we're all in trouble. We better. This guy had to lose his mind. So he was plotting this fake bullshit, trying to spread it around that I was doing these things. Eventually, when he would have killed me, he would have said, listen, you know what he did? He lost his mind. The guy was killing everybody. He was doing all these things. And this was his little plot. So, again, I don't mind the FBI and the cops trying to put me away and do their job. They got to protect the public. That's their job. Me, I don't have to do that to my co-defendant. To me, that's ratting in a different way. It's no different than taking the stand. If you're going to put your partner away, there's no different. I think you guys all as cops would understand that. Most people will. Had you said, all right, I'm going to take the hit. You're talking, you're talking a hit of about 30 life. to 50 years, right? Life. No, life, life yes. without parole. Okay, life, life without parole. parole. This was like a RICO thing, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I was charged with, I think, four murders, conspiracy to murders, and every other thing, 
racketeering. It was life without parole. And so then that my kids would have had to listen to this and say, he didn't even fight back. He just sat there like a potted plant. Right. Maybe he is a fucking animal. 